Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week, I have a very special guest, good friend of mine, somebody that I've been in contact for a while in the space, and uh, somebody who's, I think, been in the space longer than almost anybody I can remember. Uh, big voice as well, Dan Held. How you doing, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Will. So what's new with you? What have you been up to lately? Oh, man. Um, things are crazy over at Kraken, just in terms of growth. Uh, you know, I lead growth marketing over there, which is acquiring new customers. And it's just been crazy in terms of our growth as a company. But, uh, you know, also scaling um, publicly, we've talked about how we just hit 2000 employees. You know, Kraken is getting pretty huge. So there's all sorts of fun scaling issues that come with that. But I think it's overall really, really exciting, really, really bullish. Uh, the people I'm working with at Kraken are phenomenal. So Let's put it this way. It's, it's a lot of planning. As orgs get bigger, communication doesn't increase in a linear fashion. It increases exponentially because you have to communicate with more and more stakeholders on more on different levels. And so, you know, that's been like a really fun exercise of like digging in deeper on, on how that all works. So yeah, things are awesome at Kraken. Um, personal, personal life wise, you know, I'm just putting out Bitcoin content. <clears throat> For me, it's been fun kind of getting more into the YouTube side of things. I start, stood up my YouTube channel this year. So, uh, you know, it's been fun developing YouTube content, really digging in on, I think YouTube is such a phenomenal channel. Like I've been on Twitter for a, a super long time and I love Twitter. Like Twitter is my, that, that's where I'm hanging out the most, but YouTube is really fun. I think YouTube offers like a really great way for people to sit back and just ingest information. Um, and it's much more, I think has much deeper sort of like information flow because you can visualize things, right? Like on, on Twitter, you can, a tweet storm can only convey so much and on a podcast, it's audio only, but with YouTube, it's got video plus audio. So I've been really enjoying that as like a new format for, to build Bitcoin content, to hopefully bring more newbies into the space. No, totally. That, that's awesome. What do you think about like, you know, actually running a newsletter, I found personally that, you know, I, I do a lot of like market related analysis. So going back and, you know, I basically have this diary, right, where every week I can see like what my thoughts were in the moment based off like the certain market conditions, etc. Like, do you do you find it useful in that sense of I know you don't do necessarily like full on market analysis, but and you kind of just talk a bit more like ideological about Bitcoin itself and a bit more, you know, like, uh, broader things, you know, about it. But have you have you found that it's been useful to you as well to kind of like at least get your thoughts out every week and kind of sit down and go through that process? Yeah, um, you know, a couple of point, <clears throat> a couple of points on that one. I didn't consider myself a writer until like about three years ago. <laughs> Writing is a it's kind of like a muscle. You have to learn how to flex it. But I think anyone can be a writer. Um, and I want to be encouraging of new people who want to write content about Bitcoin. There is a whole wave of great Bitcoin content creators after 2017. A ton of them came out. Um, but I think there should be another big wave of Bitcoin content creators in 2021. And so anyone can go write. And I very much encourage anyone to go try it. Um, writing consistently is tough. <laughs> it's something that I struggle with a lot. Of like putting out a newsletter every single week is really hard to do. But I think you're right. There are some really cool things that it sort of adds, which is like, yeah, it's a diary of your thoughts. For me, it's more of, um, it's really cool because when you teach, you even you increase your learning because you increase your capability of like crafting the narrative around the topic, which means that you understand the topic in a more complete fashion. So uh, with a lot of these topics, what's kind of been cool is I get, you know, I go down, I sit down and write about it, but sometimes I'm not hundred percent, you know, like really, really, you know, knowledgeable on it and I'll have to go learn. So it forces me to go learn, forces me to defend a narrative around Bitcoin more completely. And I think that's a really rewarding experience in and of itself of like, just being able to write good content about Bitcoin, but also defending Bitcoin's narrative. Um, and that's where I think like we've seen this across the board to some of my content, but some of the more famous examples are like proof of work and Bitcoin's energy consumption. You know, that was an argument refined through tons of other great Bitcoiners before me who wrote great content that are all laced through the, through the, through the article. And then after that, you know, I, I compressed that, made it a little bit more digestible, and then we've had other people do an amazing job. Like, for example, Nick Carter, I think, can kind of claim the proof of work crown of like the most content on proof of work. And he goes in a much more rigorous analytical perspective to defend the narrative around that. But yeah, I think it's a really fun exercise when you write a newsletter. Um, yours, you know, I think is a little bit more like technical, some of the analysis, whereas mine is more topic based. So it'll be like, 
the last one I wrote on was Bitcoin micropayments or Bitcoin tipping and, and, and uh, how Lightning and Twitter are all intertwined. So those are kind of more macro topics on like, for example, I'll weave in some of my background because I worked at a company that did micropayments on Bitcoin called Change Tip. So, you know, I'll weave in some, some experience combined with like just kind of my, my open personal thoughts. But yeah, I, I find writing a really fun exercise of like learning a little bit more about it, but also it's kind of like the most intimate way to get to know me because this is, I don't have to, I don't have to make or make my tweet and you understand this, make my tweet work with the algorithm. <laughs> it's a newsletter. It goes straight to someone's inbox and I can just write as I speak almost, which is really, really fun versus like, you know, do I always want to tweet a one, one liner, a tweet about Bitcoin? Not really, but that's what the algorithm likes. And that's what the audience likes. Yeah, totally. And then you kind of go through like cycling through the the same kind of things after a while, I'm sure after being in the space for so long. And uh, that kind of segues to me uh, to my next question is like, how has the content in Bitcoin evolved? Because I mean, for me coming into the space at the end of last year, I mean, it feels like one year has been like a decade already in, in Bitcoin years. But, um, you know, there's just so much content, like there's all these podcasts, all these different personalities on Twitter to follow, and countless medium articles on Bitcoin. When you came in early on, what what really, you know, what was the content for you to, to access then? Was it more like word of mouth? Was it I hear from some people that they were like, you know, small meetups and things like that. Kind of just like walk us through what it was like back then in terms of what you had available. Yeah. So there's like the digital and the physical world. So physical world, I was at the early Bitcoin meetups in San Francisco, like back in January, 2013, back in that day, there was only like 12 of us there. <laughs> it was, it was tiny. I mean, it was, I mean, Charlie Lee was there, Fred Erson, Fred Erson, Brian Armstrong, Jesse Powell, um, Jed McCaleb. Um, and there's a couple others too, that are kind of more old school that people don't remember. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, um, it was, it was pretty small. I mean, it was just like a cooler of PBRs in a really trashy, uh, like really trashy co-working space. Um, but that was kind of really cool because there was talks and there were people that were interested in this. Um, I got into it because a buddy introduced me to Bitcoin, you know, so he paid me back for a beer with Bitcoin. So yeah, that physicality was, it was a key, key driver of early adoption because there, there wasn't a lot of great digital content and Bitcoin was so esoteric and weird at that point that you needed that like trusted advisor or like some physical body because we are humans after after all like we develop trust with people in person much more than like potentially online so on the online front i mean this was before uh there wasn't coindesk or any crypto publication none <laughs> um i think bitcoin magazine was around at that time but i don't remember it being prominent i don't remember people talking about it it was all bitcoin talk that's where the conversation happened Wow. In fact, that's where Ethereum was announced, by the way. I don't think pe most people remember that. Um, and so there were different, uh, you, would, you would usually frequent different Bitcoin talk, uh, different uh, threads. So, for example, there's a famous one called Wall Observer. That's where people would talk about trading. Um, there was ANN, and that was like stands, stood for announcements. Or the, yeah, it was, I think it was the announcements channel, and then your subject line would be ANN. And so that's, for example, like where Ethereum is announced and other bigger other, other projects. And so um, yeah, back in 2013, I, I got in back in like 2012 and 2012, like that was where people got their content from was Bitcoin talk. And uh, the first product I built in this space was called Zero Block in, in uh, March 2013. And we had the first mobile news feed. And so I hand curated all of the different data feeds for content around Bitcoin. So I know I read every single headline that came out in 2013 because we piped in like a Google News RSS feed. We had Bitcoin talk. So we'd go scrape different uh, uh, different topics or like different, um, I think it's called threads in Bitcoin talk. So uh, whenever something hit the announcement thread, it would show up in zero block. You're, you're short in fiat. And we also would uh, scrape our Bitcoin, the Bitcoin subreddit, the hot hot one. And so I've seen almost every single post from all three of those, you know, from basically mainstream press and both of those channels. And then the first blogs came about in like May, 2013. That's when I think like Coindesk started to come out. Cause I remember adding the Coindesk RSS feed, um, to bit idiot. Uh, Ryan Selkis was one of the first bloggers in the space. I remember when I added his blog. Um, so yeah, it was very, very sparse. Let's put, let's put it that way. There wasn't and the information at the time, I mean, everyone would always go, 
go read the white paper. And it's like, maybe if you're really technical, sure. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're an engineer, maybe, but like anyone who's not an engineer, I don't think it's a great place to send someone. And then Satoshi didn't think so either. He wrote it for a bunch of cryptographer nuts. You know, like these are like really nerdy cryptographer guys like that he wrote this for. He didn't write it for like CNN. Um, so yeah, it was actually very, very difficult to find good Bitcoin content back in that day. Um, and it was hard to learn. It was hard to like, I, I wouldn't say that I fully understood Bitcoin until like 2017, 2018. Like I understood the basic principles and I bought into the value prop of gold 2.0 and I understood building blocks of how it worked, but I didn't fully bake my like Bitcoin knowledge in until very, very recently. And so that's where I felt like an obligation to go make more content to help people, uh, you know, go from what I went through, which took years and maybe they can go through Bitcoin and, and it only takes months or weeks. Yeah, totally. Like, I think that the kind of key takeaway there, you, you know, you hit on at the end, is just like the barrier to entry in terms of like understanding the asset is like much, much smaller than what it used to be. Um, what was like people's view on Bitcoin back then? Was it, I mean, you mentioned on like your thesis with like the whole gold 2.0 thing, was that kind of across the board? Was it more of like kind of the, the you know, e-cash thing that, you know, then people, you know, forked off in 2017 to, to Bitcoin cash? Um, like what, what was kind of the consensus view of it back then? Or was it just the fact that it was such a mixed thing and nobody really knew? It was definitely the payments narrative. I would say it was like maybe like an, 70 30 narrative uh 70 percent of the narrative was payments and 30 percent was gold um if you look at like some early if you look at like very early conversations on bitcoin talk and different irc threads within the first couple months of bitcoin coming out people do identify like oh this is like a digital gold um so it kind of depended on what lens you use to look at it through um I mean, for me, my lens was going through undergrad and studying finance and during the 2008 financial crisis. And I'm like, all these books are bullshit. <laughs> and all the professors are and everything on TV is because none of these people have any idea what's going on. And um, it was like that lack of trust in governments and that understandability, like understanding that we needed like a new sound money, you know? And then that's where, you know, if you're a gold bug, that's what's so strange is like, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like, it's, it's, that's what you've been waiting for as a cold bug. They just got too stuck on the physicality of it. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, it was, it was very much like that was the narrative that made sense because that's what Bitcoin looked to be useful for. It's two purposes are it's two value props are, you know, scarce supply, a, a sound money plus an, an immutable money, a money you can't censor. So using Bitcoin for things that usually are being censored. And so, uh, for me, uh, you know, early on in the space, like the narrative around payments, I think were kind of a, a weird, perverse sort of VC influence. Um, you can't go to VCs and be like, yo, I want to disrupt the central bank. <laughs> like, they're just not going to get that. They're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, most of them don't understand monetary theory and, and, and stuff like that. Like they're not going to, they don't understand economics. They think about consumer products and business products. They don't think about things that way. So the early companies in this space, I think it was, I don't know, like, I don't think there's like someone who incepted the narrative, but it's definitely a narrative feedback loop of, of like VC, of like startups trying to raise money, not finding like a narrative fit until they go, we're going to disrupt Visa. And then VCs are like, oh my God, I love that. Here's $10 million to start your company. And so that was a lot of the feedback loop process that I think occurred um, and we see this across the board in, in venture capital, VR, AR, bot, uh, chat bots, um, you know, AI, like whatever, whatever startups have to say to get funding, they do Bl blockchain, ICOs, Web3, you know, all of these are like narratives that people want to hear on the VC side. And so you weave that into your pitch deck, even if it's totally, I would say like outside, like <laughs> the, what, what the core utility of your product is. So I think there's this feedback loop that happened in 2013 where VCs invested in the disrupting Visa PayPal narrative. Then that narrative got superimposed on Bitcoin. Everyone worked towards that goal, including like uh, Coinbase.com or like Coinbase, BitPay. I was uh, in 2014, I was at blockchain.com. And so a lot of stuff was built around that. Um, you know, being at blockchain in late, late 13, or, you know, and through 14, it was very clear, you know, to see that. <laughs> people didn't want to use Bitcoin for payments. 
And then when I went to go work at ChangeTip in 2015, same thing. So for me, like we were building the product to go solve that problem that we thought existed and no one cared. Clearly, Bitcoin didn't have product market fit with the payments narrative on both a quantitative perspective, which is that experience looking at the data and qualitatively. Why the hell would you want to spend your Bitcoin? <laughs> you know, it's, it's great if you want to buy something that you couldn't before because those things are censored or to store wealth. Um, but other than that, you don't need to use it for your everyday coffee payments. Totally. So that's how I think that early narrative was spun up. Um, and I'm not sure many people have really dug into it from that perspective, but I was out in Silicon Valley. And after being there for eight years, you kind of see how these narratives get spun up. It doesn't matter if it's real or, or not. That's what they're investing in. And you have to like tap to that, that tap to that beat to get funded. What was it like in 2017? Because, you know, from, from some of the people that I hear that, that were, you know, in the space earlier on that, you know, late 2017 in terms of like, you know, the ICOs and just the, the craziness was that was like the all time max. And we've never really, I mean, we had like Elon on SNL shilling Do Dogecoin, which I think was kind of an intermediate term topping signal. But still, I mean, I hear from people that 2017 was kind of unmatched in terms of, you know, VCs were just writing checks to anybody who just, you know, put together a little project and threw the word blockchain on it. How crazy were things actually back then? And like, what were, what were some of the examples that you could give in terms of like how wild it actually got? It's fucking nuts, man. I mean, like, so Silicon Valley, I don't think people really understand how intense these narrative feedback loops are. Like in Silicon Valley, you go to dinners, parties, dates, friends hanging out, VC meetings, business meetings at Google, Facebook, Uber, whatever. Everyone talks about it. Everyone talks about the new hot narrative. Silicon Valley is all, always about chasing what is next. So they want to make sure that it's a social signaling tool to signal that you're relevant because you have to signal that you know what the new hottest thing is. If you don't, it looks like you're not staying relevant. It's a signaling mechanism from a social preservation perspective. And then second, you always think, can this change our business? Because if this changes our business or this changes my startup's business, I need to hop on this bandwagon. And the sooner you do that, and if you're early, like we were in crypto, Bitcoin, you make a lot of money. And so there's always this, this hunt for what's next, right? Um, and in the ICO boom, I mean, it was just insane. Like there was literally like people shilling ICO stuff everywhere. Every party you went to, someone had an ICO or they bought into an ICO. And it, it was mania. I mean, you heard the word ICO whispered everywhere too. Restaurants, bars, happy hours. People, you hear, hear the word ICO, ICO, ICO. It, it was nuts. Um, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, that was just, that was just mania. And I mean, Silicon Valley too has like really exceptional, talented people that are, that are, that I've learned from and then that I continue to learn from. And, and there's, you know, you learn great process and ways to think through problem solving, how to think creatively, how to test your assumptions. And then, and then you have a lot of like very scammy grifter types, which are like a lot of the, so how this, how these scammers work in Silicon Valley, I've seen, I've seen a bunch of them. There's, so what they typically do is they have a perpetual startup. So it's plausible deniability of scamming, but it's basically scamming. So what they do is they, they have a string of failed startups a lot, right? And so you can't go out and point a finger at them and be like, hey, you know, you're a scammer because in Silicon Valley, you never know when someone's going to hit it big. It's just like the gold rush, right? Like you never know. Someone could have five failed gold mines and then the sixth one hits gold. So there's a, in Silicon Valley, people never call out the scamminess because um, you never know the difference between a scam and hitting it big right? Like there's all sorts of gray areas where people have broken the rules and it worked out. So with a lot of these though, the more, I would say edging on the more scammy side, you've got these folks who have perpetual startups. What they do is they go raise $300,000 from some gullible people. They pay themselves $150,000 a year to go work on the startup. Startup within two years fails, and then they do the next thing. They don't, they don't have a good reputation, so they can't go raise money from the big, big people and go raise a $10 million round, but they can raise enough to go pay themselves a decent salary for a couple of years until people forget that the project fades out and they're like, yeah, it just didn't work out. And then they go do the next thing. So a lot of those people, um, which, you know, you see them at happy hours, parties and stuff, they kind of, you know, they're always grifting around. Um, a lot of them latched onto the ICO boom. That was a huge boon for them. 
because you didn't have to prove anything out and ICOs were basically just marketing polish. And so a lot of them just, you know, really, really focused on that. Um, so yeah, I would say like, yeah, there, there was a lot of faces to the ICO journey. And then you had like people talking about how venture capital is going to be disrupted through ICOs. I think people forgot about that narrative. You know, that was a, that was a strong narrative back then. So, you know, a lot of people took that narrative and applied it to whatever business they had. So like, yeah, Uber on the blockchain, um, v VCs were like, it might disrupt VC, you know, all these, all these narratives were appended to whatever you worked on and whatever made sense to you. But yeah, I mean, what's funny though, is Silicon Valley, they always hop onto things like this, but very few think critically about it because you cannot go against the grain. If you go against the grain, that is the worst possible thing to do in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the most open place in the world, never to speak your mind. If you go against the grain, like you are sort of like an outsider, <laughs> uh, you have to buy into the narrative and you have to parrot the narrative or people will be like, so you're saying that A16Z is wrong, or you're saying that like Sequoia is wrong, or like these really powerful people. Silicon Valley is really not about open-mindedness. It's about conformity to whatever the hot narrative is. Like for example, ARVR, very early on, you know, and I'm a gamer, like I play Xbox and I, I love gaming. I've got a VR headset. Very early on, I realized like, this is really overhyped. <laughs> like, you know, let's assume give like VR some assumptions of usability and cheapness. It still doesn't like gameplay wise, you know, we just still don't, there, there was a lot of reasons to believe that it wasn't going to work. But everyone in Silicon Valley was like, yeah, VR, AR, man, that's like the new thing. You know, and it's like, I'm like, cool. Have you ever tried a VR headset? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay, well, I've tried five because I was a mentor at Boost VC. And at Boost VC, they had a bunch mm -hmm. of VR companies. So I was boots on the ground trying out these products, thinking through from a product perspective of like, what problem is this solving and would someone use it? And I'm like, I very, very clearly don't see a use here. And like, we're, we're really, really exaggerating the VR claims and, and all of Silicon Valley was like, oh, well, I don't think so. <laughs> it's like, well, most of you have never even tried one, you know? And so that's what I'm talking about is, is we've seen these come and go. And you don't really want to be too negative about this because if you're too negative about it and something does become big, then you look like a Luddite conservative. And um, also, you never know when the VR startup, they could pivot. If they were failing, they could pivot into something else, hit it big. And you didn't want to be too negative about that founder or that product. So that's how Silicon Valley works. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't sound too appealing to me. I got to be honest, Dan. Yeah, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a thrilling place. It's, it's a, look, San Francisco never stopped in the Bay Area, never stopped being a gold rush city, right? It's just a different type of gold rush. And with gold rushes, you have really good people and you've got really strange people. And this is the gold rush on ideas, right? Like any idea you could go build. But uh, yeah, there's the pros and cons of it. I certainly didn't like some things, but I certainly really love some other things. Sure. I kind of want to, so I, I want to get to the market. You know, I kind of want to get in depth on that. But first, I do want to touch on this before we kind of go down that rabbit hole. Um, just briefly, I want to just get you to talk about maybe building your personal brand, kind of becoming, dare I use the word influencer, um, and just kind of how you've kind of rose to recognition in the space. You know, I think there's, there's definitely some listeners that I have that are kind of looking to, you know, get their name out there, kind of, you know, get involved in the space, et cetera. So, I mean, I think, to an extent, you know, you being in earlier on, not saying that that's the sole reason, you know, why you're, you're, why you're a big name in the space, but I think that gave you a bit of an advantage, but, you know, you definitely understand how to, how to do those things. So, uh, you know, what maybe little gems or tips could you give to the audience in that sense? For sure. Yeah. And, and luckily my profession growth marketing is also what I could apply with my brand. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think with, with like a personal brand, it's never been more valuable to have one. Um, for, you know, for me back in the day, like everyone knew my products that I built. So zero block was the most popular mobile app in 2013. Ask anybody from that era. So like I had good notoriety with that, but I wasn't like a great speaker. I wasn't a writer. Um, I didn't really understand how to like build an audience or be someone, you know, more influential. And after 2017, when I saw like what happened with the whole block size debate, I felt like I had that Bitcoin down and that I hadn't been like a big, strong voice in the room. And I wanted to make sure if something like that ever happened again, that I was there. Also, I felt like a lot of the content getting noobs into the space was lacking. And so I wanted to go write about different Bitcoin topics and defend Bitcoin, but also bring in newbies. I would say for anyone building a personal brand, like start today. Look, you're, you're going to overly think it and be like, I don't have anything great to say today. 
I, you know, you're going to worry about, oh, well, what if I say the wrong thing? Yeah, you're going to say the wrong thing someday. Um, just get your voice out there, see what the, see what your audience thinks about it, and then refine it over time. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I don't necessarily like tweeting one line tweets about Bitcoin every day, but that's what people want to hear. My newsletter is more of my exactly how I feel. I just kind of like let my thoughts loose. Um, and so the way to think about it <clears throat> is start today. That's like the number one piece of advice to start today, even if it's smaller. Two is consistency. And this is absolutely the most important thing of building a brand based on how these algorithms work, because if my life is spent thinking about how these algorithms work, you have to produce content every single day, forever. You cannot ever let up, not, not on any day. Even on days you feel like you don't want to tweet anything, you have to tweet something and it has to be good. And same with like LinkedIn or YouTube. YouTube, you can do different cadences of like once a week um, in other channels. But the way that these algorithms work is essentially you need to produce content for the people that consume the content. And if you aren't producing content for them that day, the algorithm needs to find someone else that will keep them entertained. So that's why consistency is the number, like I would say the most important factor when building a brand and the hardest one, the very, the very hardest one to keep up because you're going to have days where you do not want to do it. And you're going to feel like you're getting repetitive and you're going to have, you know, weeks or months where like people try to cancel you every other day. You know, I, I block a hundred people a day to give you some perspective on how bad it gets at 400,000 followers. So, um, you know, I think that consistency is really a key element of that audience narrative fit. So a lot of people, and this is like a big, big mistake. Um, they go out and they speak exactly how they feel about things. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I speak exactly how I feel about Bitcoin. I am not diluting or distorting my underlying core feeling about Bitcoin. I am super bullish about Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin and everything I've written about, I care deeply about Bitcoin. You know, at the same time, you can have your message not be diluted, but then also tweak the message to where your audience will like it a little bit more. For example, tweeting like one-liner tweets about Bitcoin. Would I prefer to write a paragraph? Sure, but no one's going to read a paragraph. They want to read one line and get the quick hit. So always thinking about, is my audience, is my message resonating with my audience? This is a core marketing principle of when you create marketing content, you want to make sure that your audience likes it. And so I think that a lot of influence, a lot of like crypto influencers don't ever grow past a certain point because they just talk exactly how they want to talk and they don't care what anyone thinks. And that's cool, man. I mean, I'm fully supportive if you want to do that, but if you want to grow and if you want your message to be for a bigger audience, you have to tweak it a little bit. It's not like you have to change it that drastically. Um, a lot of people think it might be like a dilutive function, but it's not that at all. It's more of like, you need to tweak it for your audience a bit. Um, and then the other one would be going multi-channel. Multi-channel is tough. You need to become really good at one channel first, but I think multi-channel is a really cool feedback loop where, um, you know, I've got 45,000 followers on LinkedIn. Um, what's really weird, <laughs> weird about these things is like, I went to money 2020 and I don't hang out on LinkedIn. Like I'm not chilling on LinkedIn. I hang out on Twitter. <clears throat> I had more people come up to me at these different parties on at Money 2020 and say, hey, Dan, I follow you on LinkedIn. Then they said, hey, I follow you on Twitter. So like you go to where the audience is. You don't go to where you think the audience is. You go to where they are. They're on crypto, in crypto and Bitcoin, they're on Twitter for sure. But I pulled my audience and I asked, where else are you? And LinkedIn and YouTube are big. So that's why I popped up a YouTube channel is for, for these reasons, you know, is that um, I have a big audience on YouTube and think about it. Like you're, you're younger, I'm 33. And, you know, even for me, my age group, no one hangs out on Twitter. Like they hang out on Instagram, Snapchat. And for y'all, y'all are like Snapchat, TikTok, and like YouTube. And so, you know, these Bitcoiners are like, cool, I'm just going to post on crypto Twitter. And I'm like, all right, if you only want to reach that audience, cool. Like there's, it's a big world and, and, and people like to ingest data in different ways. They like to read it. They like to watch it. They like to hear it. And so, yeah, I think like going multi-channel, you know, once you've achieved greatness in one channel, going multi-channel is probably a really good strategy. No, I think, I think that's an excellent point. And, you know, what you said kind of applies to like, you know, financial markets too, in the sense that I think, you know, obviously like I only hold Bitcoin, but I'm just saying this in the sense of like, from a trading perspective, when you're thinking about like, you know, 
what what you, what your thesis is versus what the what the other people's thesis is, right? Like this is the whole Dogecoin thing, and why I think a lot of it, a lot of the Bitcoiners are baffled by the rise of like Dogecoin and Shiba. It's it's because you're thinking about the way you view things versus trying to put yourself in the other other people's shoes and and think what they're thinking, right? Because that's what you should be doing in a market. And so, you know, and not saying to, for listeners, you know, because I know that the hardcore Bitcoin guys will tear me to shreds. I, you know, I don't own any of those things. But what you're talking about is basically this informational free market, right? And and you need to go to where, you know, the listeners are. And, and as you said, you know, if, if you don't want to do that, that's great. But if, you know, if you're really looking to like maximize that growth and you got to go where the people are. Um, so cool. So I think, I think that was awesome. That was, that was really insightful. I learned a couple of things from, from that little uh, spiel there. And I now want to kind of pivot into, into you know, in the, in the market itself. I think, um, you know, we, we talked briefly before and, and we were kind of talking about the difference between the market now and where it was when you first got into Bitcoin. So I guess I'll, I'll just give you the floor to just, you know, run through some of those things and, and key differences that you found between kind of market dynamics now um, in terms of a price action, you know, the, the actors we now have in the market, et cetera, products that we now have in the market um, and, and just how, how much more mature uh, the asset class is compared to when you first came in. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people, people are like, oh man, it's, you know, they're like, oh, well, they feel weird about this stage in the Bitcoin cycle. They're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to survive or not. <laughs> like, like, what are you talking about, man? I got in when it was like $10 and uh, not, not that I backed up the, I, look, I was like 25. I didn't have that much money. <clears throat> and it also took a week to wire money to Japan. So it wasn't exactly a thrilling experience to send that money overseas. <laughs> um, but like Bitcoin is $10, 90% of trading volume is on Mt. Gox, which got shut down. We thought a lot of Bitcoin transaction volume was through Silk Road, which it wasn't as much as we thought actually when they looked at it, but it was scary in the early days. I mean, the infrastructure was so shaky. It was such a tiny space. Like you could fit everyone who was work like everyone major who worked at these companies, you could fit them all in like a, you know, like a, a small dining room, you know, and in fact, there were meetings like that. Uh, it was called the Bitcoin Supper Club that got started in December, 2013. And uh, yeah, like the space was tiny, like there wasn't people forget that the space was totally broke. Like no one had any money back in the day. Like it was in the, in the bear market of 2015, 2016 wiped out a lot of people. A lot of people in Bitcoin back in that day thought I should spend my Bitcoin to build Bitcoin startups. And so like you've got founders who spend tens of thousands of coins, keeping their startups afloat and then the startups failed. Some of them succeeded and you see some of those today be worth multi-billion dollar companies, but you know, it was a really harsh, harsh environment back in the early days. Like infrastructure wasn't there, you know, to put it frankly, like we were all very much B players. Like we were the only ones willing to risk our reputations on Bitcoin and no one who was really good wanted to do that. Um, in fact, you can kind of, I think you can see, I think Brian Armstrong publicly reached out for a founder of Coinbase for a co-founder on like Hacker News and stuff. So you can see Brian's, you know, yearn to find someone good. Um, even in 2017, so 2013 didn't attract really any, any big talent. People thought Bitcoin is just a bubble. 2017 is where we saw some talent start to come in. We started to see infrastructure be built out. F CME Futures launched. We had much more rigorous uh, exchange infrastructure and less centralization with just like one Mt. Gox. Um, we had better like uptime. We had better APIs. We had better support. Uh, we had better funding methods. Um, and then now, I mean, just the usability and the number of GUIs or the interfaces, you know, you can go download like Cash App, Kraken, all these different products, uh, PayPal, Robinhood, you can go and, and buy Bitcoin almost anywhere. And so back in the day, it was only from like Kraken and Coinbase and a few other, you know, Bitstamp, et cetera. And uh, so I think that the experience, like the user experience, the uh, infrastructure, the funding methods, all of that were really, really, I, th I would say like, really critical for, um, you know, Bitcoin to succeed. And so Bitcoin has never been stronger from that perspective. And I think a lot of people forget and they, <clears throat> and they look back and they're like, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. I'm like, it was pretty bad. I mean, there's probably some moments where in another universe, Bitcoin might've died or like been, had, had been severely damaged for like a decade or something. And luckily it all worked out. Um, you know, so I think that a lot of people like just don't really understand what it was like back then. It was, it was like very, in 
people, you know, I, we were always pretty bullish, but you know, I don't think people thought it was in a, going to succeed this fast. I think they thought it might take like another 30 years or something. Um, you know, where it, people weren't using, you know, back in 2013, people weren't looking at these, these exponential charts like you all do nowadays. <laughs> no one was doing technical analysis back in that day because it was so new. There wasn't sort of a precedence for it. There hadn't been a narrative spun up around how halvings influence price. Um, I'm sure on Bitcoin talk, someone talked about it, but yeah, it was, it was, it was tricky. I mean, back in 2016 for that having, I went to the BitGo party down in Palo Alto and there was like 10 people to give you an idea of like how small the space was and how dismal the 15, 16 bear market was. So almost everyone left. I mean, I, I left too, because there was no jobs. There's nothing to do. So I, I left and, and went and worked at Uber during that time period. Uh, Uber, not, not as a driver, but as at headquarters. So yeah, people forget that. Like it wasn't, um, you know, it, it, it was, a, it, I think I've had a lot of respect for OGs from that era because it was a lot of like very grueling, grueling startup survival. Whereas like 18, 19 companies were better funded, could survive that a bit more. Let's put it this way, with all the funding going on now, <laughs> I think people should be good for quite some time. That's really insightful. Very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I ask everybody who comes on the show this question. Um, I think it's kind of a unique question. I don't hear other shows asking. What key milestones do you think are, are the most important when you think about, you know, hyper Bitcoinization, this, this term that everyone likes to throw around? Um, what are some of those, you know, certain milestones for me? You know, I think obviously El Salvador has been a, you know, a huge one, kind of the first domino to fall. Um, also, I think about like, you know, Bitcoin getting ingrained in like culture, politics, et cetera. Um, everyone seems to always have kind of a different answer. So I'm curious what, what yours is. Yeah, so um, it's funny, I guess it's sort of like a definition of a super cycle because I feel like that term is being used quite often. Um, so I would say hyper Bitcoinization, my definition would be rapid. So what's cool about most of these definitions is we can look at one metric, Bitcoin's price. I mean, that, that sort of indicates to us, is Bitcoin going through hyper-Bitcoinization, which, which we might see very rapid price appreciation for Bitcoin. Um, I think that is the most determinant KPI that we could look at. Um, outside of that, you know, we could look at various other factors of like, um, market penetration. So like how many people own Bitcoin? I'd say that's a really big factor. And then you might see some other ones of like, I think like very like late stage hyper Bitcoinization would be, we start to see things priced in Bitcoin or sats. I think that would be like very late stage hyper Bitcoinization. That's like the final, final era of like, people are using it as a, both the store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. I think in that era, things change very dramatically. You know, I think that that's sort of like, um, you know, a really intense part of the process would be, that would be towards the end. Awesome. And then, and last question is, uh, you know, what are some of the biggest hurdles that you see Bitcoin facing moving forward? Um, you know, is it like a regulatory thing, something within the protocol that perhaps we're going to have to face, you know, further down the line and, you know, et cetera. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, luckily, I think Bitcoin, like going through the whole Segwit 2x thing, you know, I think like uh, in the, the whole big block, small block debate solved a lot of future debate problems, which was around like how do, how do changes get implemented in Bitcoin and what is Bitcoin's purpose, um, like governance essentially of Bitcoin. I'd say like future, I don't really see too many big issues. Um, one, there was one that was kind of coming up and then kind of faded away. And you might have seen this, which was around privacy. Um, there was kind of like a, the, I think the most dangerous thing to Bitcoin would be its community fracturing, which happened with the Bitcoin Cash hard fork. So when you fracture the community, since money is a network effect, you lose some of that network effect. Um, and there's some contingent of Bitcoiners that are hardcore privacy advocates. And I respect that. I respect the ideas and principles behind complete privacy. And I absolutely agree with those principles. In practicality, you're trading off auditability of the supply for uh, privacy. And that's what these chains like Monero and Zcash do is they trade off auditability. And I don't really think that's a good trade-off because Bitcoin's core value prop is in its auditable 21 million hard cap. It's in its uh, sound money principles and that's its core value prop. And that will be its core value prop for a long time. And so I wouldn't want to sacrifice any of that for privacy. So that looked like it was going to become kind of a uh, contentious 
uh, kind of split in, in perspectives in Bitcoin, but I don't think that it's largely faded away. Um, so I don't think that's a major issue, but that would be one of them that I thought might have come up, you know, in the future of like, well, what do we look at in terms of how to make Bitcoin more private? I think this answer has been somewhat solved by looking at like Zcash and Monero's lack of adoption and price appreciation, um, where it's sort of the question answered itself of like, is this a feature that Bitcoin needs to have to, to be competitive? And the answer is largely no. Um, now, Bitcoin is is pretty private with uh, coin joins and other solutions. So I think Bitcoin's community has largely gotten around the shelling point, uh, uh, shelling point narrative that coin joins and lightning and other like ways to obfuscate Bitcoin is, is a uh, perfectly acceptable, acceptable way to keep it private while keeping auditability. Awesome. That, yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, Dan, I want to just give you, you know, the floor to, if there's anything else you want to, you know, kind of get off your chest before we wrap it up here. Uh, I learned a lot today and, and I really appreciate you, uh, you know, coming on. I know you're a really busy guy. So thanks for uh, giving us your time today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Well, I would say, um, you know, I think we're still in the bull run. I think we're still, we've still got a lot of growth to go. I think you've seen this in your on-chain data. You know, for me, like it's uh, being an old dinosaur like myself, I feel like we haven't seen that sort of blow off top. We haven't seen that really big run up when like, you know, this is this is the moment where you, <laughs> you go home or you talk to someone and you hear the word Bitcoin mentioned everywhere. We haven't hit that point yet where you haven't had your uh, old high school acquaintance or middle school acquaintance text you and be like, hey, man, I heard about Bitcoin. What can you tell me about it? You know, when those moments happen, we start to get closer and closer to that top. But I'm super excited to see Bitcoin kind of fulfill the end of this bull run. And maybe this bull run doesn't end, you know, if we talk about like super cycle theories and stuff. But yeah, I think that like I've waited nine years to see this moment. And I'm super excited to see how this all plays out over the next six months. Totally. I think that's an awesome uh, place to wrap it up. Thanks so much, Dan. Do you want to just plug in your, your Twitter newsletter, et cetera? For sure. Yeah. If you like, uh, want to hear my day-to-day -day thoughts, follow me on Twitter at Dan Held. If you want to hear more of my kind of like in-depth, like I said, kind of more unfiltered opinion, go follow me or go uh, go subscribe to my newsletter, theheldreport.com. Cool. Take care, man. Hopefully we can get you back on sometime, you know, maybe in the, in the next couple months towards the end of the year when we're... Uh, when we're ripping more. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me. Cheers. Take it easy.